has started. Um, I will be watching the waiting room and continue to admit folks as they join us. So thank you again to everyone for joining us today for our first of a couple of lead presentations in our webinar series. This is focused on introduction to lead and how it impacts environmental justice. Next slide, please. We want to give a thank you today to CareSource for their generous funding of these educational opportunities. Um, also want to mention that CareSource does not influence the content of the presentation. Next slide, please. And just briefly, I wanted to introduce Dr. Joel Davidson, who will be joining us today. He's gonna tell you uh, much more about himself and we are so grateful to him uh, for providing this educational opportunity. So Dr. Davidson, I will turn it over to you. Well, thank you very much. Um, I uh, appreciate the Ohio AAP very much for the work that they do. And I'm very glad today to be talking to all of you about uh, something that's near and dear to my uh, work uh, as a clinician. So I'm a general pediatrician. I work at Akron Children's Hospital. Um, and I, I, most of my work is in primary care. Uh, the, pro the problem of lead uh, became an issue for me because a lot of my patients were uh, coming back with, with high levels. Um, and that actually spurred me to, to have some interest in this space. So back in like 2012, I started to uh, take on some of the, the responsibilities as co-director of our tertiary referral clinic. Uh, we call it the lead clinic and primary care providers that identify elevated kids with elevated lead uh, will make referrals to our multidisciplinary team. And um, so I'm grateful for all of you being here today. Uh, I understand that a lot of you are community health workers. I love community health workers. I think that they, um, each of you provide really, really important uh, services, education, uh, relationship building, um, and, and direction for families um, and kids. And I really appreciate the work that you do. So I'm hopeful that today we can uh, learn a little bit about um, the, the exposures um, of lead in Ohio um, and, and what risks are inherent in that exposure. Um, that will increase your um, skills in communicating with families um, about risks that are within homes uh, related to lead, and that we will um, help you to learn how to support families in accessing uh, care related to lead support and, and services. Um, so um, a, a few disclosures just to start. Um, Along the way in the work that I've done, I have received some funding um, first through some foundational grant uh, uh, dollars um, through some of the research that I did in collaboration with Kent State University. We're not going to be talking about much of that research today, but some of those those projects were foundational in kind of the evolution of, of the information that we're going to be talking about today. Um, there's some videos and some educational handouts that are going to be referenced in this talk. Uh, those handouts were um, graciously, the, the funding for those were provided by the Sherwin-Williams company. I do uh, want to disclose that, but I also want you to understand that they had no uh, say really in the content. Uh, my, myself and my team uh, really were able, along with um, collaborators from Community Legal Aid here in Akron, um, in putting the information together that you're going to be seeing today. So what is lead um, and why is it a problem? Uh, you've, you've all of probably you know, coming to this because you understand that lead is an environmental toxin that's not healthy for children. Um, we sought to answer this question for families in a way that would help them to simply understand the issue of, of what's going on with lead and lead toxicity, but uh, also give them an idea of what to do, both within their homes, uh, their communities, and their neighborhoods. Um, and, and so this is the first of two videos that you're gonna be seeing today. And um, the videos accompany a curriculum that incorporates uh, some of the, the handout pieces. Uh, and actually when we designed this curriculum, it was around, um, actually targeted towards interventions with community health workers. Um, so I'll reference the curriculum later, but I think that this is a great starting point. And I'd like to um, take the technological challenge of trying to share this video uh, with all of you. So what we're gonna do, is I'm gonna to stop to share for just a second because I have to share this in a very specific way to get this video to work. All 
All right. Kristen, I'm going to let you give me a verbal confirmation that you can hear this, but I'm going to start playing the video. We're just going to all settle into this talk and learn a little bit about what is lead. Parents to their kids to protect their family from dangers they can see. Sometimes there are dangers they cannot see. Lead is a metal that has been used to make many different things, which are often found in the home. Let us explore some areas in the home where lead can be found. Kids can be exposed to lead by things they put in their mouth or eat. It can also be in dust and inhaled. Our bodies do not need lead. When lead gets in our bodies, it can move to the blood, brain, bones, and other organs. Even when the source of lead is removed, it can stay in the body for years. Children younger than six have more problems when they are exposed to lead because their brains are still developing. With low lead levels in the blood, you may not notice any symptoms in your child. But lead can affect your child's ability to learn, focus, and make decisions. At higher lead levels, you can have behavioral changes and damage organs in the body, sometimes needing medicine or a trip to the hospital. There are things you can do to decrease lead exposure at home. Good hygiene can keep lead from mixing in with your food. Have everyone wash hands before meals and snacks. Do not let your kids eat food off the floor. Have them eat meals and snacks at the table. Providing your child with key nutrients like iron, calcium, and vitamin C can decrease how much lead gets into your child and keeps his or her body and brain healthy and strong. Children with a low iron level in their blood can feel tired and cold, find it hard to think or concentrate, and can easily get sick. You can find iron in spinach, chicken, beef, pork, fish, and beans. Vitamin C is important because it helps your body use iron better. Foods rich in vitamin C like oranges, tomatoes, berries, and broccoli are really good foods. Calcium is important for healthy bones. The right amount of milk is three glasses a day. Too much milk can decrease how much iron your body can absorb. Sources of calcium include milk, yogurt, cheese, eggs, figs, leafy greens, and sardines. Getting your child screened for lead is very important, especially if they are younger than six. Identifying the problem early can help your doctor and the school work with your child and your child's development. Talk to your child's doctor to see if a lead level has been checked or if a test is needed. Give me one minute to filter back to where we were. All right, thanks for bearing with me. I had to switch some things around here. Okay. So the problem of lead exposure has actually been a problem for a really long time. Uh, back in the late 1800s, lead was an issue, maybe even uh, before the early 1800s, but uh, even in like Roman times with uh, the building of some of the aqueducts that moved water, um, and some people postulate that that may have had lead may have had something to do with even the fall of the Roman Empire. Um, but throughout the 1900, uh, from, throughout the, the night from 1970s on, um, we've actually done a lot of things in the policy realm to really in, to meaningfully significantly reduce the burden of lead exposure to children. Um, and, and you can see we've removed you know, lead-based paint from even uh, any of the paints that are used in housing. 
A lot of the, the lead influences that, that were present in housing materials were removed. Uh, we removed lead from gasoline. Um, and then over time, we also uh, narrowed the stringent controls around what we considered to be elevated levels. Um, so, you know, some of my older colleagues I remember times when a uh, high lead level was something over 25. Today in 2021, we, um, you know, if you're following lead closely, uh, the federal government actually just reduced the threshold for what is considered a high lead level. Um, again, no lead level is safe, but you have to draw the, the kind of the, the, the elevation somewhere, and that's now at 3.5 micrograms uh, per deciliter. So this graph uh, is one of the figures from uh, what I think is probably one of the most important papers around uh, lead. It's a 2016 article from uh, pediatrics talking about uh, kind of giving a, an overview of the problem of lead. For those of you who are joining us um, next, uh, next seminar, this would be a, a worthwhile paper to read. But basically what this graph is showing is all of these policy interventions that, have, that I just talked about have really led to the to the decrease of uh, what we're finding as average lead levels in children. But you can also see that there's, there's still an ongoing problem, which is why we're talking about this in a webinar in 2021. So it's important to understand where lead is coming from. There are, very, there are multiple sources of this uh, heavy in, environmental metal. Uh, most of them are in the home, um, and that's why we're gonna talk about the home environment, uh, the place where kids spend a whole lot of time um, as the primary source, and that exists as dust. Uh, you can get it in water exposures. You can get it in outside soil environments where kids play. Um, and of course, we're talking, you know, a lot of times people say, oh, you're talking about lead paint. Um, and, and paint, certainly uh, older paint, paint that's, you know, in those times before 1978 does have lead in it. Uh, and, and we're also talking not just about, uh, you know, old walls, but walls that have maybe layers, and those layers are then disrupted. Um, and I also often remind people that disruption includes like water damage. Let's say there's a, a leak in the, the upstairs bathroom that, that then is going through the ceiling. Uh, that ceiling then has exposure of that, you know, 40 year old um, lead paint. Um, we featured uh, some of our Nepali speaking families uh, and patients in the videos that we developed because they are a high significant uh, community that has elevated lead exposure and that comes out of our research. But um, immigrants sometimes bring things from their um, home country that, that has lead exposure, some old pottery, um, or, or they had some experience in their home country. Um, some of our refugees, uh, battery, uh, you know, car battery exposure, that was kind of one way that they would heat their homes, um, and some different cultural things, uh, like what they would put on their face in this girl in the picture. Um, not all of this uh, facial cultural makeup is, it has lead in it, but uh, there are some groups out of Indiana that showed uh, that, that it is possible that um, some cultural remedies can include lead. Toys, um, old pottery, um, occupational exposure from the parents, uh, parents that work in factories or work in uh, environments where they're using materials that have lead in them. Uh, they can bring that dust and bring that uh, fine material on uh, home with them. Um, some hobbies that commonly um, have uh, lead exposure uh, I like to fish, and if you read the the you know the waders and uh, some of the weights that we use, uh, those are still right now made out of lead, and so you have to be careful. Uh, we found patients that have had some gunshot wounds, uh, older adolescents that um, have an embedded uh, gunshot that uh, that shot itself is made out of lead, but even just the powder um, of that can be something that you think about. Somebody that likes to renovate old windows, uh, beautiful stained glass, uh, some of that older beading um, is, um, has lead in it, or somebody that likes to refinish uh, furniture, all that like sanding things down um, can emit that dust and that dust can then be inhaled, um, you know, or, um, or put into the mouth uh, on objects that kids are, are picking up and putting in their mouths. Kids at younger ages, less than six, are at risk for the sources of lead because of kind of their move, the way that they move around houses and the way that they do a lot of that hand to mouth behavior. So if you look um, at this uh, 2006 article where we see the most amount of exposure and the biggest increase in uh, lead levels as it relates to children, the biggest is dust. 
Um, and if you kind of think about that warm, um, you know, that warm day that the sun is shining into your window and you can kind of see the dust particles floating around, lead can be a part of that. Um, and so, um, you know, and the lead dust really is coming from areas of friction. So when that window is getting opened and closed, open and closed, open and closed multiple times, or the same with a door, um, uh, that then kind of kicks that dust up into the environment. Um, water sources, uh, lead uh, sources from renovation and, and then soil are kind of the, the last in decreasing amounts that lead to the contribution of kids being elevated. Uh, this is a national sample uh, of, of information, but uh, the state related information that I have to share with you kind of mirrors that. Um, and this, this is uh, from the Ohio Department of Health. One of my colleagues that works uh, in the lead uh, abatement office presented with us a, a few years ago. So this data is a little bit old, but it really does um, hold true. Um, you know, to give you kind of the idea of the number of risk assessments that they're conducting. Um, but most of the time, it's paint and dust and, and less amount soil. A lot of uh, discussion after the Flint water crisis around water, but water really in Ohio is not a significant source of. Um, lead exposure for children, but we are continuing to look for it. Uh, and, and different communities throughout Ohio are having discussions about these old, older leaded uh, water lines. The issue that happened in Flint is that at the water treatment facility, they decided to kind of introduce a process that uh, in, kind of corroded pipes, and, and they knew that that was going to corrode the pipes, and that's why you were getting images of kids, you know, drinking water that looked like it was tainted with, uh, you know, it was very rusty, dark uh, brown, and of, of course that was from the degraded old pipes that were in that community. Um, and so we have the potential to do that, um, but our water sources are actually uh, treated in a way that's not designed to, uh, you know, degradate those pipes. But you can also see, you know, there there is a significant uptick in, in occupation. So I think it's important that we talk to families about what they're doing um, and. and Usually, I just have families ask their employer or go to their HR office and ask if lead is uh, in, involved uh, in any of the processes of the things that they do at work. So um, this is really our um, compilation of kind of answering this question about what is the problem with lead um, in a way that's designed for families to digest it so that it doesn't seem overwhelming. There is a lot of information out about lead, um, and we'll talk about how kids you know, get screened for lead and what we do in the medical environment. But uh, we wanted to design a, a piece of information for families uh, that was one, um, visual uh, primarily, uh, that could cross uh, literacy levels, that could cross, um, you know, cultural and language barriers. Uh, we did translate these uh, handouts in multiple languages that are common to the patients that we see in Akron. Um, you're probably missing uh, Swahili if you're from the Columbus area. Uh, and it, of course, th these are not all of the available languages that we all intersect with um, on a regular basis, but we felt like those were the most common ones that we actually had funds uh, and availability to do, uh, to translate. So the words are translated, but we also wanted somebody that couldn't read to be able to pick this up and understand um, who's at risk. Pregnant women, infants, and young children, children less than six years of age, mostly. Uh, that's the time in their life when their brains are developing, where lead has the biggest uh, opportunity to negatively impact their um, neuro, their, their cognitive and emotional um, development. Um, health effects in kids, uh, learning difficulties in school age, um, development in terms of the development of executive planning functioning. Um, these kids are at risk for ADHD, um, and so behavior is, is are, are sometimes, uh, you know, a health effect. And actually, families that come to us um, can sometimes describe very well that uh, their kids' behavior is getting better as their lead levels decrease, or they'll say their behavior is increasing. Uh, you know, I think that their lead is high, and it, it, it turns out when we test them that that sometimes is the case. Um, lead can, at the higher levels you'll see in a few slides, cause anemia. And um, we look for constipation, so we put that there um, because kids that are constipated hold on to lead in their gut more uh, for a longer period of time, and the lead levels can continue to increase. So where can families find? Uh, where do you find lead? You find it in paint, dust, at the job, uh, in some jewelry, um, and in water and plumbing. So we put these 
as sources, not we want people to be afraid of their water, but that they think about uh, all of these available sources. Um, you can get to all of our resources at uh, akronchildrens.org backslash lead. There's a resource tab that you'll go to there uh, where you can access the videos that we've talked about, the handouts that are on uh, in this within this presentation, and as well as the curriculum uh, for community health workers. So in the curriculum, we have the family start with the video, uh, or we have community health workers start introducing the, the families to the video, and then we have opportunities to say, um, you know, let's talk about that. What did you see? Do you have any questions about that? Uh, what are you hoping to learn about lead? And then we have uh, the community health worker um, walk through with the family some of these specifics about where they could actually find lead uh, in their own home. Uh, the back part of this handout is then uh, the, the basics of lead. What can we do? And the video is alluding to some of these things, but basically, um, wet mopping, taking a wet cloth and kind of wiping windowsills, countertops, commonly used spaces, drastically reduces the fact that that uh, burden of the dust can then settle on those surfaces and objects and then be transferred to the child. So um, the, we've been alluding to a little bit of the soil. Um, and so leaving shoes at the door um, is a good practice for families, um, especially if they're, if they're at risk for lead exposure. Um, we found a lot of exposures on front porches, um, and, and as, as that transition uh, from the outside to the inside, taking off those shoes can be a practical thing uh, for people to do. And of course, washing hands, uh, getting all that dust and, and things off of hands before uh, you go to eat or, or go on to play. Um, screening, so talking to, to the doctor, making sure that if you're uh, supposed to get your kid checked, that your lead level is checked. Um, knowing your home is a, a very broad term, but it, it, um, the curriculum is designed to kind of explore some of the specifics with that. But knowing if your home is actually at risk or not, maybe not just your home, but a home that the kid uh, spends time in. A lot of kids spend time with aunts and uncles or uh, babysitters, grandparents. Uh, all of those places should be considered as potential sources. The home base before that are, homes that are built before 1978 is really your your year that you're going to kind of have in your head as a year that puts a house at risk for lead. Uh, and especially if that house is under ill repair, uh, that's going to elevate your concern that, that lead is potentially an issue uh, within a, a, a person's home that you're spending some time as a community health worker. Um, of course, then, then testing. Um, testing is not the, the solution to lead, but it is kind of the current state of how we address this problem. Uh, and we make sure that kids that come into medical care in our offices are screened for lead at appropriate ages. And we'll get to what those uh, ages are in a little bit. From a nutrition standpoint, we want to encourage iron, vitamin C, and calcium. And it's not that uh, eating those things will uh, stop the exposure. It does not. But uh, those things do help mitigate some of the effects that we see of lead and are um, going to, to help uh, basically prevent that anemia. Uh, while also, you know, building good solid bones, and uh, we'll we'll talk about that in a little bit about bones and and where lead is uh, stored. So, how does lead get into the body? Uh, we talked about this a little bit earlier, and this is the image that I was kind of alluding to as in my description. But uh, all of that dust um, inhaled or ingested, and then that hand to mouth, uh, this this cute little guy, um, you know, chewing on his book, reading. Uh, at his young age is great, uh, but it, it is also, if there's lead in that environment, it can be a potential exposure. Um, so lead is uh, absorbed but it, it, into the body, but it has no actual function. There's no reason that lead needs to be in our bodies, unlike some of the other things like salt um, and sodium and, and potassium and things like that. Uh, but it gets into red blood cells, into liver, into kidney, uh, into the brain, into, into the blood, um, sorry, into the bone. And, and it actually can take a while depending on where that lead settles um, and how long that child's exposed to lead. Uh, really depends on how long it's gonna take to get that lead out of a, a child's body. So uh, if it's in the blood, it's on the order of months. If it's in soft tissue, it's in the kind of also uh, less of a time, 40 days. But if it's in bone, it might take uh, 10 to 20 years for that bone to turn over in a way that excretes it into the blood that that can then be uh, eliminated from the body. And it, it, families often ask me, how long is it going to take for my kid's lead level to go down? And my answer almost always is, 
Uh, it depends on eliminating the exposure first and foremost. And so that's where your work is going to come in is uh, trying to educate families about where that um, exposure is and, and then what families can do. So uh, lead does lead to cognitive impairment. It, this cognitive impairment is unfortunately irreversible. This is not something um, that, that can be changed once that exposure happens. So it's gonna be really critical that we find ways to, to stop kids from getting eliminated or stop kids from getting exposed to lead in the first place. That's not to say that we aren't gonna put our full force around kids that are exposed, actually kids that are exposed that then get exposed to early intervention services, those services do matter, uh, but they're, they're, they matter because we know that this is a, uh, an effect that can happen. And we see these effects at really low levels, which is why you see the, the threshold of uh, concern um, decreasing over time and, and now being three and a half. That also has to do with how, the, how we calculate uh, exposure. So as the exposures total, uh, as the exposure goes down, the average blood blood level goes down and the threshold is based on a, a percentile um, of, the, uh, of a national um, survey assessment called the NHANES. And statistically, that's also why it's at three and a half. But we want to pay attention to these lower levels of lead exposure um, to help kids out. Um, and we're seeing most of those uh, effects in um, attention, executive function, planning, uh, visual motor uh, reasoning skills and social interactions and behaviors. This uh, graph shows you um, kind of on the trajectory of increasing blood lead levels, uh, what can happen. The reality is, is that most kids, even kids that have levels up into the 40s, 50s, 60s, exhibit no symptoms at all. And so you might look at a kid and think that they're doing well. Um, and if you don't test them, and learn that what their blood blood level is, um, you may not see any of the physical signs or symptoms. Um, but we can, through research, know that there's some developmental problems starting less than 10, that we start seeing some impact on red blood cells in the mid uh, teens and moving up uh, into the 30s and 40s, um, vitamin D metabolism is impacted. Um, you can see hypertension in older folks uh, that, that have exposure to lead some abdominal pain and colic. Uh, and honestly, in this 50, and, uh, 50, 60, 70 range, what we're mostly worried about is um, encephalopathy or a non-responsive patient. So um, when I start seeing levels in those highest areas, I'm mostly worried about is the child acting the same way that they have been. Um, and, and those kids that have encephalopathy can be quite significant and very obvious. Uh, and that's a big deal. Um, and, and we have had some kids that uh, end up in the ICU at those higher levels um, with those symptoms. And, and death occurring somewhere between 100 and 150. Um, obviously, we don't want those kids to, to die, but there, are, there actually is a risk uh, with very high levels. Um, so I'm gonna move now to, to talking about uh, primary prevention, secondary prevention, and tertiary prevention. I made mention that what we really wanna do for kids is not just test them, see if they're high and respond um, with, our, with our architecture of, of early intervention services, uh, medical services, uh, you know, and, and community-based services after they're exposed. What we really wanna do is prevent that exposure from happening in the first place. And that's what primary prevention does. So high quality preschool for, for universal kids is a primary prevention mode. Um, you know, enriching environment uh, for, uh, Environmental education, um, family enrichment programs, that's going to be something that we're going to do that, that's primary. Um, having kids not move into houses that are exposed to lead in the first place with good housing, um, housing code and, and enforcement. Um, you know, employers telling employees that, they're, that what they're doing is exposing them to lead and, and educating them around that is going to prevent them from exposing their kids to lead uh, and the negative effects of it. Um, this is something, this is an infographic that I designed along with my legal aid colleagues, um, lawyers that help with um, transforming health outcomes for children. And this is not a representation of what we're currently doing. It is actually a representation of what we probably need to be doing going forward. And so uh, for those of you who are advocates, um, this is really where we um, focus our advocacy work around uh, what to do uh, in, these, in these different domains of our work. Um, and so we would love it for, you know, there to be 
uh, inspections done before kids and families move into houses for there to be a social understanding and representation of the value of a house being lead free uh, as, as um, consumers, families choose to move into settings. Uh, the reality is, is that this is juxtaposed into lower uh, socioeconomic strata uh, communities where the decision really is around cost of housing and quality of housing. Um, and it's a difficult problem. Uh, there are certainly a great number of stakeholders that are invested in this work, uh, both on the positive and the negative side. Um, but secondary prevention uh, are, are things like, um, you know, screening, things that we do um, in, our, in, in the medical setting, uh, where we're looking at what are the blood blood levels of patients. Um, you know, a, maybe um, some other examples of, of secondary prevention. Um, helping families obtain um, benefits around educational access um, once a child is exposed. So um, one of the things that we've done in Ohio is actually now that uh, lead exposure by itself is a, a qualifying condition uh, to receive special uh, early intervention services, um, which is a really big win for us in Ohio to be able to, to do that because before you needed to, to be a little bit farther down the road of demonstrating a developmental problem Whereas it, this recognition and access to those early intervention services for kids that have a, a elevated lead level um, recognizes that they may develop some of those things going forward. And those early intervention services, while not reversing the impact of lead, will uh, lead to better outcomes for that individual child. Um, the tertiary preventions are more of um, kind of the community-based kinds of things. So removing a blighted home, for example, from the available housing stock um, it is an example of ter uh, a tertiary or downstream um, kind of prevention work. Um, so he here's a good um, infographic for, for all of you to just understand a little bit about kind of the interplay between um, home environments, uh, public health, which is kind of where community health workers live, um, school environments, you guys have some overlap into that school environment as well, uh, where the medical community works. And, and again, most of these are, are uh, secondary and tertiary prevention um, opportunities. So in our medical offices, we're going to take a look at kids who are on Medicaid, who live in a high-risk zip code, um, and, and or have a, a known risk factor like their family said that their house is from the 1800s or that we recently did some remodeling or renovation in an older home. Uh, we're going to screen those kids at 12 months and 24 months. That's the Ohio law is to screen uh, that category of children. The other caveat to that is that practices can decide if they know that the housing stock within their uh, communities is uh, has a significant number of, of dwellings or homes that are built before 1978. Um, those kids should be tested as well. Um, our our uh, health system and, and primary care network has done a tremendous amount of work around this uh, screening practices um, to make sure that we're screening as many kids as possible. Um, but if you're out talking with families, uh, basically if you're out with families as a community health worker, I'm very sure that you should be talking about uh, getting those kids screened at 12 months and 24 months. Um, and what, what I know is successful um, when you get the message out from a community level is when those families come back and they start asking, is today's visit appropriate to check lead? Um, and so I, I can tell you that, um, that your interventions when you guys start talking about lead in the community will come back to, to providers and doctors because I have those conversations with families and, and it, it reassures me that, that kind of all of us together are gonna help move this issue forward. Um, so from a medical perspective, we try to, once kids are identified as being elevated, first of all, we screen usually with a capillary finger stick, um, but those kids that are over the threshold, so over three and a half, are going to need a, a, ve a venous confirmation because the dust that we've been talking about can live on fingers and can be part of that finger poke. Um, we're looking at, at medical therapy, medicines to help draw out the, blood, uh, the lead from blood. Um, and eliminate it from the body really at levels over 45. And then um, at levels really uh, depends on this, the constellation of symptoms, the social situation, um, in, in those higher levels, we're making a decision also about should we do, admit that patient to the hospital 
Um, do they need one medicine to help them eliminate the blood uh, from their body or the lead from their bodies, or do they need, you know, multiple medications? And that all depends on the levels. And I don't want to focus on that on that too much. But the next um, video that we developed in this um, in our work was uh, how to protect families. Uh, how, how can a family protect themselves from lead? And this transitions into more about what do they look like, what do they look for in their house, what community-based resources can they rely on. Um, and, and again, there we have more resources uh, about kind of um, the the different things within communities, uh, grants, and those sorts of things under our resource tab. I'm going to try to play this from here. And Kristen, I'll let you give me another confirmation if you can hear that. All right. Parents do their best to protect their family from dangers they can see. Sometimes there are dangers they cannot see. Lead yep, is a we have sound. To make many different things, which are often found in the home. Let us explore some areas in the home where lead can be found. Kids can be exposed to lead by things they put in their mouth or eat. It can also be in dust and inhaled. Our bodies do not need lead. When lead gets in our bodies, Sorry. it moved. It played the wrong one. This is the one that we saw before. All right. You're gonna to go to the website. You're gonna go down. It's just a little information about our lead clinic. Go down to the resources tab, and um, here's the videos. And that's still the first video. All right, sorry about that. Um, how do I protect my family from lead? And the videos are also available in all of the translated languages. We had our interpreters uh, read the script that we made for the video and um, timed the videos appropriately to match uh, the visuals that were being displayed. Surrounding your children and family with a safe place to live is an important part of parenting. Knowing when your home was built is important because homes built before 1978 are more likely to have lead. Lead used to be in house paint. When paint starts to chip or peel, lead can get in the dust and your child can put it in his or her mouth or breathe it in. Look for chipping and peeling paint in and around your home. Pay special attention to windows, windowsills, doors, door frames, porches, and outside of the home. If there is peeling paint, keep kids away from these areas because the dirt can have lead. If you live in an older home and use the original soil for gardening, there could be lead in the soil. Try a raised bed garden with new soil. Lead, dirt, and dust can be on the bottom of your shoes. Keep shoes worn outside by the door and do not wear them in the house. If you use older ceramic dishes or brought dishes with you from another country, they could have lead. The health department can test them to see if they have lead. When you clean, use a damp cloth for dusting and wet mop your floors. Vacuum your carpets frequently, at least once a week. You can check with the health department to see if you can rent a special vacuum to remove more dust from the air than a regular vacuum. Sometimes adults are exposed to lead dust at work, which can cling to clothes and then be brought into the home. Kids can then be exposed to that lead dust if adults are not changing clothes right after work. Adults who work in factories should ask their employers if there is a risk for lead exposure at their job. Other types of jobs that can involve lead are house painting or remodeling, refinishing furniture, mechanical work, or working with car batteries. Old plumbing can be made of lead. Letting your water run for two to three minutes in the morning before you use it can clear the water that has been sitting in the pipes overnight. Fishing and hunting equipment like fishing lures, sinkers, and bullets could contain lead. Keep these locked up and away from children. Knowing where lead can be found in your home is very important. 
Look at your home to see if you can find any concerns about lead exposures. If you think your child has been exposed to lead, first, talk to your child's doctor. Your child may need a blood test. If you rent and are worried about exposure to lead, ask your doctor or community health worker for a referral for free legal help from Legal Aid. They may be able to help make the landlord fix the problem. If you own your home, your local health department can help you with what to do next. Children need to be out of the home when work is being done to remove lead. Use a contractor trained in proper lead removal. If you plan on moving, look at the new place carefully to check for chipping or peeling paint, water damage, and the age of the home. Remember, if you think your child has been exposed to lead, first talk to your child's doctor. Your child may need a blood test. All right. Kristen, are you still with me? I am, yep. Okay, and wonderful. You can see kind of the non-presentation mode of the slides, right? Yeah, so it looks like exactly the thumbnails are over on the side and the main slides in the middle. All right, I think that this is gonna bring us back up so that folks should bring it back up on your full screen. Is that right? Yep, it's there now, thank you. Uh, okay. So the, we have basically the, the two videos and the two handouts that we developed. And this is the second handout. And we designed this more as a, a checklist um, of things that the families could focus on. Um, you know, what, what do I need to do before I move to a place? We'd love to have families understand um, when they move into a new place, what questions that they can ask, either if they're renting or if they're buying. And, um, you know, I'm not going to go through all of the details within this checklist, but it's basically think about how old it is. Think about how old the windows are. Um, talk to the owner about lead. Is this, do you know that there's lead that has uh, been in this house before? Uh, we have had a few families who we are aware of that live in places where uh, we had a previous child that lived in um, that same house that we've talked about lead already uh, before. Um, this breaks my heart because I think that that's something that we should be able to figure out. Uh, but it does happen. A landlord might, uh, you know, kick somebody out or, or you know, kind of take advantage of, or know that know that their kid that kid is high and inappropriately, um, you know, have that family move out instead of remediating the problem and then re-rent that place uh, to another family. Um, it doesn't that doesn't happen a terrible amount of time, but it does happen. Um, if, if you're, um, you know, reading the lease, having a lease, um, uh, that, that's another thing. Sometimes families don't know that they need to write that down. The lease not only protects the landlord, but it also protects the tenant. Uh, and a lot of our legal work, um, you know, that's one of the first things is let's take a look at what your lease is. Um, making sure that, it, um, one, if families are talking about lead um, and they're, they're having this conversation with their landlord, it's a little bit contentious. Um, Making sure that they're still paying their rent is really important also because a lot of the housing advocate lawyer uh, teams can't do much if families are behind on their on their rent. The lawyer team can put that rent into an escrow so the landlord doesn't have access to those funds, but the family still needs to, to continue their part of the obligation of that arrangement. Um, and, and then last, um, if you live in a home with lead, what, what should you do? Um, you know, talk to us, <laughs> um, you know, rely on the resources, us being uh, medical providers, but also talk to us being you, uh, the community health workers, and you guys are gonna be helping, I hope, to navigate um, what, what, you know, what should families do next? Um, and we built that into our curriculum in the final parts of the pages um, of that workflow is to kind of, what community resources do you need to access? Have you talked to the health department? What is the health department's um, response? When are you expecting to see a response next um, from, from somebody that you made a referral to? Um, if you, we kind of broke it up to if you rent or if you own, because the, the, the situations are a little bit different uh, depending on that situ those situations. So if you rent, you need to have that conversation with your, your landlord. Um, you know, it, it, 
make sure that families are, are having those conversations in writing. Uh, and that's not always uh, easy for families to do, uh, again, with some um, literacy and uh, link, sometimes language being barriers. But you guys as community health workers can definitely help with, with eliminating some of those barriers. Um, and then we talked about the, the rent piece. Um, if you own your own home, you need to find out if you're eligible for some of the grants. Um, the state of Ohio, uh, Governor DeWine has used, um, you know, has really broadened the ability for houses to be eligible for abatement or improvement if lead is an issue in a child that spends time in a home. Uh, when I first started this work in 2012, you had the kid had to live in that home that had to be their primary dwelling. Now, if the kid does spend time at grandparents and we can demonstrate that the grandparents house has led to that kid's lead, elevated lead level, um, we can use some of the grant funding that uh, the governor has allocated through Medicaid to uh, address that problem. And so there's, there's a lot of opportunities for um, you know, and actually that are benefits to landlords um, and their dwellings to, to make those places safer. Um, I think we talked about most of these, uh, except for the, the frequency. Um, we do want families to kind of mop at least once a week. We want them to, to wipe down windowsills um, in kids' rooms and countertops once a day um, and, and vacuum regularly. Um, there's a little bit of an academic question around is vacuuming you know, or sweeping more helpful, uh, but generally uh, kind of any ways that you can reduce the risk of lead dust exposure within a home is helpful. And um, I have put links into this uh, slide deck, uh, things that where you can explore a little bit more about lead. Um, there's the Ohio Department of Health has a lot of excellent resources. I put the link to our um, hospital here. Uh, I'm going to take us now just to our community health worker curriculum uh, page and kind of show you a little bit about what that is. Um, I may be stealing a little bit uh, from the speakers next month, um, but hopefully if you listen to both of those talks, uh, you can kind of look at what resources are available, um, what, how can you practically have this conversation um, about lead, uh, either for families that, that just want to know a little bit more about it or families who have been exposed. And you may find yourself doing uh, one or both of those depending on what your role is. Um, this is just a, a cover page. Who, who is this for? Um, you know, what are the objectives for your conversation with the families? Um, starting with just what do they want to know? Um, what do they want to talk about? What questions do they have? Uh, we use this in our clinic to talk to frame the purpose of a visit. Um, some of our visits are a little shorter, but um, then, then I think some of your touches with families. Um, but if you can address what they're mostly concerned about, then you've done a good portion of your work um, when you're interacting with families. Uh, we did design this curriculum too, uh, in terms of total time to last about an hour to two hours. It kind of depends on how much specifics that you get into. So you read the video and then you ask the family some questions. What did you, what did you see? Was well, any of this new? Um, do you wanna change your list at all after you learned about some of those things? Um, kind of narrowing in on that discussion. And then we have a discussion about nutrition in ways to try to improve um, families access and, and getting their kids to eat some of those the foods that are high in iron, um, vitamin C and calcium. And it basically starts with like, what does your kid like? What does your kid not like? Um, I, I'm not going to suggest something that your kid absolutely hates. There's other options within the food groups. Um, and we worked out with uh, one of our dietitians that works on our multidisciplinary team uh, to come up with some of this work. So um, some more specific, you know, are, are there any foods that your family would avoid for religious or cultural reasons? We're not going to suggest that you eat something that is on your, you know, cultural don't don't want to eat list. And then we tried to pair this next part with visuals. So um, really colorful. Hopefully you saw that in the videos as well um, and, and enticing, but also kind of gives examples of what we're talking about. And that the idea here is that you start circling some things uh, that families actually could eat. And, and if they can get some things within each, within each one of these categories, then you're going to be able to start to build that complement um, that's actually practical for the family. Um, so here's the vitamin C section, uh, a lot of fruits, you get some of those like lemons, limes, oranges, uh, strawberries, raspberries, um, but also some vegetables, um, things that families could grow on their own, 
Uh, a lot of our uh, refugee families are very good um, gardening. Some of the families that you interact with may or may not be familiar with um, with you know the the process of gardening. Um, but another plug uh, on the food side about um, access for families um, to to take their um, SNAP benefits and use them at local farmers markets when those are available. Um, foods that are high in calcium, uh, milk is the most obvious, but there actually are others. Um, you know some of those squashes. Um, this time of year, sweet potatoes, um, sardines or canned salmon if kids will eat it. Um, but again, we tried to give it enough opportunity to say, hey, there might not be something, there might be something on this list that your kid doesn't like, but let's find the ones that they do. Um, and then the next part is um, really related to nutritional goals. So trying to set reasonable goals, we have some um, things there. Um, the next part is about going through the house. And so the, the idea is that you understand a little bit more now about going through this kind of a training about where lead is, and you wanna impart that learning uh, with the family. And we've designed this kind of checklist to be something that you could just go through the, the house with um, and, and kind of identify some areas um, and actually go into the front porch, go onto the back porch, go into the living rooms, the family rooms, the dining rooms, and kind of just answer those questions. Are we seeing anything here that is of concern that might we might need to avoid um, so that your kid can be safe in that environment. Um, and so, so this is kind of just repeating, but giving you space to, to kind of put those in. Um, the kitchen, we did add things like, um, you know, overseas or using pottery from old, um, you know, from places that, um, from out of the country, uh, because that is a risk factor. Um, you know, and then uh, floors also matter. Um, hardwood's a little easier to clean than carpet. Um, a lot of times if families are renting, they can't change that necessarily, but it's still something to talk about. And then hobbies, um, and we kind of put this into areas, you know, are you putting that stuff out of the way, out of reach? Is it, are, are the, if you're doing, using guns or, you know, if you have guns in the home, are they locked up? Um, kind of a, a separate plug there, but you know, how a chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics that you're um, with now uh, is very interested in, in doing that. And there's some other opportunities, um, you know, for that discussion, but it, because of its connection to lead, um, there it is. Um, and then employment, shoes, cleaning. Um, and, and then this is what I was talking about before. It gives you an opportunity of a place to record. Where did you identify um, a, a next step, a need? What do we need to do? Do we need to talk to the doctor? Do we need to talk to the health department? Do we need to talk to the lawyer? Um, and, and what is your what is your step? What does your plan look like for that family? So this is a, designed to be a working document for both you uh, to uh, as a community health worker, but also for um, for the family to have for themselves. Okay, so I'm gonna go back at this point, and um, I would like to entertain any discussion that this this group here has. And we're gonna save a few minutes at the end. Um, for us to talk about some upcoming opportunities. And yes, webinars. thank you again so much. So everyone right now is muted, um, but I we have a small group of folks, so I'm gonna actually oh. um, unmute everyone or ask you to unmute yourselves, and then you will be able to ask questions verbally, um, or also you can type them into the chat box if you have questions or comments. Just remember, as you are unmuting yourself, if you have loud background noise, you might want to uh, be able to minimize that. But I see a few people who are unmuted. So any and, comments, and questions? I, I, I will say, as a presenter, um, Zoom kind of puts me in a, um, a vacuum. I cannot see any of your faces, but I will be able to hear your voices. Um, and so it's just, it, it's a comment about the virtual uh, world that we live in, in terms of interaction, but I would really love to have a few minutes of interaction and, and um, you know, some understanding about how you, uh, any questions that you might have that we didn't talk about, um, we'll start I'd be there. I'd more than happy to go first. Um, my name is Esther Keys, and I work, I'm actually a bilingual family support specialist in Clark County. And... Obviously, my little families are all um, um, Hispanic, and to go along with that, um, most of my families do rent. 
and we currently have a handful of families that have found themselves uh, with children with high um, lead levels and um, involved either in developmental disabilities agency, uh, which I'm also the interpreter for, uh, but um, also in a situation where the landlords are ignoring the fact of the situation of the homes that they have rented. So with that, what else is there that can be used to support these families that find themselves in a home that they really can't afford to move out of? Um, do you have any suggestions on that? I do, Esther. Um, this is why I said I love community health workers. You're out doing so many really critical um, things with families. Um, with your interpreting, with your navigating, um, and, and right now with your advocacy. So thank you. Um, and, and I share your concern. Um, I, I think that families that speak a, a second language really are at risk of being taken advantage of. Um, you know, what, what county did you say that you're from, Esther? Um, actually, uh, I'm, I serve as uh, the Hispanic uh, population in Clark, County, which is actually uh, Springfield, South Vienna, New Carlisle, uh, that that population, and there's okay. there's a huge growing population in that area. Yeah. All right. So here's my a couple practical things that I have for you. Um, number one, we want to make sure that those families get their houses that that a lead assessment happens. Um, and so if you're having trouble, if you if you think that that has not happened you need to contact the, the state Ohio Department of Health and kind of see who's responsible for your county. Um, in, in our area, some of the assessors are, are county-based uh, and they're sometimes just a little bit more accessible, um, but the state does get notified of every kid that has an elevated lead or should have a notification of that. Um, it's reportable, all, all of our labs report directly to the state and they do get that information and they have been responding. I will give a plug to my colleagues at the state Ohio Department of Health. They've been through the ringer um, and, and they are trying, I'm sure, with their all hands on deck response to COVID. Um, I, I know that they're not ignoring those kids that have elevated lead, uh, but just we have to recognize that their system is quite taxed right now. Uh, so one, and making I, sure that that, yes, that sir, assessment I was going to say something uh, along those lines. When you do reach out to the folks that you know at ODH, would you also let them know that it's critical that they provide an interpreter of the home language of that family? Uh, it's not going to do that family any good if they get a phone call in English and a voicemail is left in English. They're, they're at a loss. So if you would be so kind as to include that message to your contacts at ODH, Absolutely. I would so appreciate that. Um, and, and you're right. Um, so then the, my next question is like, do you have a community legal aid organization in your county? Um, that would be, th those are very appropriate referrals if the landlord is ignoring um, you know, the, the problem. Um, it is really yes, the landlord's obligation to address this problem. So. Yes. Um, I, I would reach out to your local community legal aid if there is one. If there's not, um, I, I would talk to the state, and, and the state sometimes does have some ability to make things happen uh, when landlords are being negligent. Okay, all right. And I know firsthand that um, I think it was last year that some monies were actually uh, brought back into addressing homes that are riddled with lead. and that was something that I really was able to work with um, and very appreciative of that money uh, having been found again. We, we went almost two years without any remediation to, to uh, correct the situation in those homes. So when you reach out to your contacts, please let them know that yes, that is very appreciated and the money is going into the right area. Um, as far as I'm concerned with the little families that I've, I've had a, a pleasure to work with. So mm -hmm. please thank them because it's, you know, you have to use the sandwich approach. You have to say something nice and then negative and then finish it off with something nice. So please finish it off with, yes, I appreciate the money that is being directed in the right direction. Absolutely. All right. Any other comments? Oh, go ahead. Yes. I wanted to say any other comments or Questions?
Well, I'm available. Um, you can see my information here. Um, email me if you have any questions. If you have some successes, I'd love to hear uh, and share some of the good work that you guys are doing here in Ohio uh, in the roles that you have. So I'm going to just let uh, Liz or um, Kristen finish it off. Great. Thank you again. So um, in your slides, you will also have this link to other led resources through Ohio AAP. We'll make sure you have access to those. And next slide, please. Um, and also, this is just our flyer for the remainder of the upcoming trainings. This again will be in your email and slide deck and the link to register for the additional trainings. If you haven't already done so, will be there. And I think we have one final slide today. Which is again, a reminder of the second uh, led webinar, which will be coming up on January 21st, again, over the lunch hour, implementing lead screening resources and education during home and virtual visits. And I'll make sure you have this link so that you can register if you have not. Um, please always feel free to follow up with the Ohio AAP if you have any questions, need additional resources or connections. And we appreciate very much you joining us today. Uh, Monday, you'll be getting an email with a link to the recording, all the slides, um, some handy resources and all those links, and also um, what you need to complete for any CME credit. So thank you again for joining us. I know this is a very busy time of year. We wish you all uh, stay well and have a happy holiday season. Thanks again. Thank you. Bye, everyone.